leading figures in sociology of science and technology. Uh, the author of uh, very famous uh, books like the Golem series, uh, the Golem, the Golem at large, and Doctor Golem. Is that yes, correct? Yes. And the wonderful uh, book about the history of the synthesizer, Analog Days, which has received several prizes. So Electronic music synthesizer. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, so we're very, we're very honored that he's uh, is uh, here today, and uh, I give him the floor. Thank you. And the title, as you know, is Cooking Up Science yeah. today, so yeah. it will start. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for coming on such a, uh, a snowy day. <laughs> we, we, I live in upstate New York, and uh, actually we, our snow is just about finished, so I was amazed to <laughs> discover snow. I didn't have the right clothes, I keep falling over, and, uh, but I'm glad you can make it here. So um, this is an experiment, okay, what we're going to be doing this afternoon. And um, let me explain. Um, I teach a class um, at Cornell University mainly they're scientists and I'm trying to teach them about the human face of science. My own background, I started off as a scientist, I have a degree in physics and I did a PhD in sociology and the class is a kind of introduction in this field we call science studies, the study of science from people with backgrounds in science but who have humanistic, philosophical, sociological, historical leanings. And um, these Golan books uh, that uh, Masikani referred to are very um, good books I use in teaching because they have many case studies um, and so what I'm trying to do with the students and this is a way of introducing what we're going to do today is I try and get them to think about the human face of science how the society gets into science and there are different ways of doing this and just I'm not going to do this today but um, one way I start off is by thinking about the role of language in science there's a very famous study in our field by uh, Bruno Latour uh, and, and Stephen Wolga called Laboratory Life, a study of the Salk Institute in San Diego. And one of the surprising things they found was that of all the activities scientists do, they spend more time reading and writing than anything else. So science is a literary endeavor. And so you can approach the social side of science by thinking about language. I often start that way when I do a, co a class like this, think about language, think about the role of the scientific paper how scientists write up observations. So you could have a statement like, Gina came into the lab and peered bleary-eyed at the gel. Or you could have, the gel was observed. <laughs> now the first statement may be actually more accurate of what actually happened in the, the life of Gina in her laboratory. But the second one, the gel was observed, is how it gets written up in scientific finding. So science in itself is a literary process of transformation of, of statements. So you can start to think, if, if you know anything about language and the philosophy of language, it's a great way into science, all the problems of interpretation and language. So that's one way. Um, another way in, which I often use, is through thinking about um, a problem in science, the separation of theory and experiment. This is a thing called the theory lateness of, of observation in science, that when, when scientists observe, they don't do it in a passive way. They're bringing ideas, often we can even call them theories, they, they may be not as formal as theories, to the process of observation. So somehow what's out there in the world depends upon previous ideas about what could be in the world. And we do little tricks in teaching that by looking at gestalt switch pictures, which you're probably familiar with, where you can see things one way and the other. And it's not that you've done anything, you've re it's the, the photons coming to your brain are the same, but you've reorganized, made meaning out of the observation. So that's another way into these sorts of issues. Um, but the way we're going to do it today is actually goes to the core of science. We're going to do it through thinking about the actual practice of science, the messy practice of science, what scientists get up to in the laboratory. And there's a key idea here, which we're going to be, this is why we'll get to the cooking side of things in a, in a moment, which is a, a introduced by a, a British, uh, well he worked in Britain, he's actually originally Hungarian, um, chemist called Michael Polanyi, a physical chemist. And um, he came up with this idea of what's known as tacit knowledge. And this is from his own observations in his own laboratory. And Tacit knowledge is actually a very deep and important idea. And this is the idea we're going to be sort of hovering around today in this, in this cooking. So tacit knowledge, it's a very simple idea. It's the idea that knowledge can be passed on 
without explicating what that knowledge is. And Polanyi's most famous example of this is riding the bicycle. So most kids learn, I expect you all here can ride a bicycle, you've taught your kids or you know, you remember how you learn. And most kids learn a similar way. They are riding along on a bicycle, sometimes they have training wheels with a parent pushing them. And then suddenly they can ride, okay? They have to master, they've got balance, they have to maybe learn a few little rules about how to get around corners and things like this. But they don't learn to ride a bicycle from reading a book on physics or the physics of balance. Okay, they're not learning it from explicit knowledge. Something is passed on, you have something new you can do, you can ride a bike, you couldn't do it before. But it's not clear that it's been, we've been able to explicate what it is that you, you've learned. And, and this is a really deep point um, about how people um, learn things and about the nature of knowledge in the world. We often, hello, welcome. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's, has been about explicit knowledge, because that's the scientific paper, is about writing things out in explicit ways, or writing things in formula or algorithms and so on. But actually, a lot of science consists of, these, of this tacit knowledge, knowledge that cannot be explicated. And this is the point that Planier noticed from his own observations of how scientists work his own practice. Sorry. Come on then, please. Um, we started already. I'm Trevor Pinch, the lecture maker. <laughs> I'm talking about um, the idea of tacit knowledge, which is that knowledge that can be passed on, a skill can be passed on without explicating what it is. And the main example is riding a bicycle. But then you start to think, um, so, so you start to think about techniques that scientists have. And Massey himself brought me up, Professor Bookie brought me up a like, nice example of, uh, in the chemistry lab of uh, you have to learn how to pipette a solution. And now you have, a, you have a, an automatic pipette, but in the days that he was doing, the days I did it in chemistry, you may remember this, you have, to, you have this device, you have to suck it up, the, the solution. You have to be really careful, because if it's a, a, you know, a dangerous solution, you suck up too much. It's a whole <laughs> skill in sucking this up. I mean, you put your finger over it and you drop it in to another container. And a, a lot of science is about these kind of manual type skills. So Polanyi said that um, Think of, of other craft sort of skills. So his whole pitch was to think of science like a kind of craft activity. So think of things like pottery. And it's well known if you talk to people, I don't know anyone here has done pottery, but you don't learn how to do pottery from reading a book. You can read a book about pottery, but it won't be enough to make you into a good potter. You have to somehow learn, these tasks are learned on the job from someone else who already has the skills. That's how most potters learn pottery. And many arts and crafts are learned that way. You can pick up things from reading books, but if you want to become good at the practice, you actually have to do it. And you do it usually with a skilled person. So someone there who knows how to do it, who's showing you how to do it. And this seemed to be true of science for Polanyi. He found that um, often the tacit knowledge in his own laboratory was it's, it's a very interesting thing. It's held often by the lowest people in the pecking order, the technicians in the laboratory, who are paid the least often, have the tacit skills to get the experiments to work. So he would observe that his new postdocs and graduate students would always hang out with the technicians in the laboratory because the technicians would show them how to do this sort of stuff. So um, this is the basic idea of, of tacit guys. You could think of, if you've ever learned um, woodworking, and um, I learned this at school. I don't know what they call it in, in Italy. You know, you learn how to plane a piece of wood. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a skill. It's a, also a bodily skill. You know, each piece of wood is different. You have to learn how to position yourself in relation to the wood and when to put pressure. And usually you'll have someone who is a skilled woodworker who's showing you how, how to do it. You'll usually screw it up. So it's learning by doing. Okay. So this, this is the... Um, way of, of uh, uh, into thinking about science as a craft activity that Polanyi wrote about. And this is his great insight. And other historians of science, there's, there's a guy called Jerry Rivets, another historian of science called Stephen Shapin at Harvard, who've taken this idea and particularly looked at the sorts of tacit knowledge that technicians have. And my own mentor, who I wrote these Golong books with, Harry Collins, has done some of the most detailed studies we have of tacit knowledge in science. So, Showing tacit knowledge in an empirical study, if you're a sociologist science, is very hard to do because it's a kind of negative thing. You have to show that something was missing because um, they didn't do it by explicit knowledge. So it's, uh, it's proving a negative is always hard. So Collins, my, my, my colleague, did these famous studies where in the early 70s they were developing lasers 
for the first time. In North America, there's some groups in North America, particularly in Canada, a particular form of laser called a transverse excited atmospheric carbon dioxide laser. You don't need to know the technical details, but this is a machine that if it lasers, it will vaporize a block of concrete, okay? So when you get your machine working, your laser working, it will vaporize a block of concrete. So what Collins was doing, he studied how the groups in the early days of lasing got their machines to work. And he found they had to visit the group that got their laser to work. So his argument was that this was a form of tacit noise. He had to actually go there and see what the people who had the machine working. And there was a very hard and fast criteria for if you were skilled enough to do this because your laser would work. Okay. Um, it's not true of all science. And there's an interesting class of scientific experiments where you have a dispute at the research front, so you don't know who the skilled people are. But when we have something like a laser that works, it's clear when you, if, if you're messing around your laser, you're not getting it to work. You haven't yet got the skill to do it. Then suddenly it works. You know at that moment you've got the skill. And this way of thinking about science in terms of, a, of skill and tacit knowledge actually throws light on one of the great mysteries. I, I did an undergraduate degree in science and physics, I said, is why we only let people actually come up with new knowledge in science, experiment with new knowledge, so late in their careers. Most of your time at school, what you're doing in science is you're repeating experiments that are known already. And it's only very, very occasionally undergrads in special research projects with professors, but it's usually in the PhD. So you have this long training before you get to actually you know, find out new knowledge. And part of the reason for that is that you're learning the skills of doing science. So, so, and you're repeating experiments that where, where the phenomena is known already. So if you're doing something like you're measuring Newton's laws of motion or something like that, and you don't get the right answer. It's not that you've made a new discovery of physics. You just weren't competent enough in the way you set up that experiment. And most of science, until you reach the undergrad level, is like that. You're repeating stuff that's known already. And you could argue that, in fact, what you're learning is the skills, some of them tacit, some of them explicit, to run experiments. There's an interesting issue. Does theoretical knowledge involve tacit knowledge as well, theory and algorithms? And I would argue it does. There's a tacit skill even mathematicians have to use in how to solve a problem. But we can get onto that later. I think, by the way, there's all sorts of interesting issues about tacit knowledge. How, um, clearly, it must be possible to acquire the skill the first time without having it passed on to you. Otherwise, you would never have a new discovery. So someone has to make a laser to work without having a skilled person. Otherwise, you wouldn't have new things in science. So it's possible that you can find a different route into it. So when I teach this stuff, the other example I go to is cooking. And I say to the students, um, OK, find a recipe. For, and I usually choose something these are American students they're unfamiliar with, a cheese souffle. And I say, I want you to go home and cook a cheese souffle and see if you can, if you've just got the recipe for a cheese souffle, if your cheese souffle will work. Now this is a good one to pick, because if you know anything about cooking, a cheese souffle is actually really quite hard to, to make. I, I've made it myself. I should say here, I'm not an expert cook. <laughs> I learned to cook from my mother, and we're going to cook some pasta, or make some fresh pasta. I've never done this before. <laughs> and, but we have um, Marna, who's an expert, but not knowing about it is really Can interesting as well. <laughs> well, not an expert. She, she knows more than and a British guy will know about cooking pasta, or making <laughs> pasta. <laughs> when I make pasta in England, I just get the box of spaghetti and put it in the water. <laughs> um, but I have done, uh, I, have, I have got skills in other areas of cooking. I had to bake scones, and we couldn't do a souffle today because it would require the oven. Um, but a, a cheese souffle requires skills like one of the things in making a cheese souffle, you have to have egg whites. And if you know anything about cooking, there's a, a, there's a skill to folding in egg whites, which you have to learn. You often see, I learned it from my mother, it's a sort of a technique for folding an egg white. If you do it too much with a spoon, you won't have the ear, you'll knock all the ear out of the egg white. So this is... So some of these tacit skills, um, and we can talk more about what goes into tacit knowledge, are, are like almost physical skills. You can think that musicians have many tacit skills. When you watch a musician playing a musical instrument, you may have done this yourself, it's not that you're cognitively thinking about what you're playing at the time, it's though your hands are working almost on their own. So it definitely seems to be part of tacit knowledge as a kind of a bodily knowledge. But we can talk more, um, maybe as we, as we, we want to get to the, the actual cooking example, I, I feel we should, we should be moving on. Now one thing my, my mentor Harry Collins always points out to me, is just in um, 
So you can think here, we can think of science as like a recipe. We're going to follow a recipe. And this is like a laser. I mean, cooking pasta or making fresh pasta in Italy is something that we know is an accepted fact of the world, right? Thousands and thousands of people are doing it, and it's repeated. This is not a new piece of knowledge we're, we're dealing with here today. Okay, so this is a standard thing. But even just, you know, we're so embedded in culture. Just Collins uses uh, an example in his teaching. He calls it awkward student. We have here a recipe that uh, <coughs> Professor Buki downloaded for um, jamieoliver.com for making pasta. And um, this, the same applies for science. You say, it says, so here's the first instruction. Place the flour on a board or in a bowl. Now you see, I can take this, place the flour on a board or in a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> make a well in the center and crack the eggs into it. Make a well in the center? So, you know, so we can quickly go wrong here. <laughs> so even following simple instructions involves quite a lot of skill and cultural knowledge that can be very specific, obviously, to different linguistic communities. What, what is a well? It's not an oil well we're talking about here. We know what sort of well it is. So, may, um, so maybe we should start on this now to yeah. see it. See, um, so this is the first instruction. We take the flour. So under under Katya's direction, Katya. whoever wants to go, not all not all together, but uh, in small groups, yeah. and start and then. <laughs> and um, we're going to try and tease out oh, some of the tacit skills involved in this cooking. <coughs> so um, purchasing the right flour, of course, ingredients, buying ingredients is obviously when you do science, you have. You have to choose your ingredients very carefully for science. You know, you have to have purified reagents and so on. So, here, Mr. Oliver recommends uh, Tipo OO flour, which is uh, used for making egg pasta in Italy. Have we got this? Tipo OO flour? Uh, this is the right flour we are yes, using? Yes, it is. Good, just double checking. <laughs> <laughs> So we place the flour on a board in a bowl, or in a bowl, you're going to do it on the board, and you make a well in the center, and you crack the eggs into it. Okay. See? Ah, so she knows how to make a well. <laughs> See, I've never done this before, like this. Uh, I've made a well in a, a bowl before, but this is interesting to make a well like this. Because I imagine there's a skill here in panning this to make certain that this bit doesn't collapse around here, right? Mm -hmm. These are, you know, bodily skills that... So can other people do this, um, Masti, do you think, or should we... Uh, yeah, just... I'm going to get uh, something because Katya says she needs a fork. Fork. She needs a fork to do it, so I'm yeah. going to get... Just, just, just to be, before we get going, I know from making scones that there's some golden rules as well that um, you should have it fairly cold. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this applies to pasta. The best scones are made in a cold, cold room. This is, room is way too hot. If I was making scones, I'd say this room is too hot. And this is why often you put pasta uh, scones in a fridge because mm -hmm. it's better for, for the dough to be cold. I don't know if this is true. Is this true here as well? Um... Should it be cold? Yeah. 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 Pastry in England, we always have to use, my mother taught me this, cold water, freshly drawn cold water. Warm room temperature water is not so good for pastry. Yeah. Uh, so, she, she says okay. uh, this Can't is the work. case for, uh, yes, for the, the, the dough for, used for making biscuits and all the mm. English. But not for pasta. No, no. Yeah. So, yeah. so not knowing this is an important thing, but this, not this, that say, say it was important, mm. these are what we call tips or heuristics. That you have these insights, and these th things can be explicated. So having the water, having the water cold. Of course, we don't know exactly what cold means. It can't be a block of ice, obviously. <laughs> yeah, natural water. 
So these are things like, we call these, and, and science is similar, like chips or rules of thumb that guide a skilled practitioner. You know, where if you're planing a bit of wood, uh, so the, the carpenter will say, you know, just try this, put it like that, and you might or put a bit more pressure there. And so the, this is another important thing in, I think, this tacit, in, in understanding the craft nature of, of science, these tips and heuristics. Now, how to crack an egg, I think. I was just reading... Um, a historical novel, and it had a chef in it, and it was referring, it didn't just say crack an egg, it said the hardened professional crack of the egg. <laughs> so there's a skill in cracking an egg, okay? Especially, if you have, I don't think you have to separate egg. If you want to separate yolk and white, if you're too, if you're not bold enough, it won't work very good. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, yeah? Now watch this. Oh, you do it like this, on the thing, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So this is again, you can't do this too strong because it would be a disaster. Two. Yeah. You have to be able to carry. This is a good skill, of course. <laughs> Three, yeah. Okay. Is this enough? How do you know this is enough eggs? Oh. Full. Are you sure? Uh, the recipe says one for a hundred grams. Uh, so you didn't, did you, how many grams are here? Stop. 500. Three for uh, Yeah. 500. We have a controversy already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is a different uh, local practice. And look, this holding it together here, mm -hmm. and this movement. And now you're, you're starting to introduce the flour in very slowly. And this is where I imagine if you're not very skilled, you can get lumps, right? Uh, well, I'll just say you can. <laughs> so, so, no salt, niente sale? No. no. But this motion here. Yeah. Looks like scrambled eggs. <laughs> So what's this recipe say at this point? I'm going to make certain that this is, this is, uh... See, this is described here as just beat the eggs with a fork until smooth. So this, this instruction, beat the eggs with a fork until smooth, does not capture. So, uh, we had this discussion earlier that the, the with YouTube, it's kind of interesting, because a lot of this cooking skills and these practical skills can be rendered in a visual form. Mm -hmm. So that makes it, if we had a video of her doing it, well, it's like seeing her do it. That certainly helps a lot. But in fact, one of the things that has changed a uh, lot, in, uh, in my opinion, in the last years, is exactly that uh, now on the internet you can find tutorials, video tutorials, yes. about how to cook. Yes. And that is much more better than reading, than just reading. It's exactly what you are saying. Yeah. That having also a kind of uh, video guide is much more effective in terms of results than yeah. having just something to read. Yes, and also for playing musical instruments. I mean, you can find similar instructions. Yeah. They're much more useful than just reading a book on how to do it or follow these chords. But, uh, so now you are doing, you know, this is the kneading stage, right? I think this is what they call kneading. Mix the egg with the flour, incorporating a little so everything is combined. Knead the pieces of dough together with a bit of work and some love and attention. They'll all bind together to give you one big smooth lump of dough. Um, so this is a skill, that just that feel of it with the hands. You have to uh, maybe somebody can put yeah, you yeah. some water. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get this somebody is, to add This is where, it? although the visual would help, the actual haptic feel of what it feels like is hard to... Uh, <laughs> so what Jamie Oliver says is you need to need to work it with your hands and do... There's even a little theoretical explanation here. Develop the glutton in the flour, otherwise your pasta will be flabby and soft when you cook it, instead of springy and al dente. Maybe another egg? 
Maybe it's a good idea. So this sticking to the hand, is this normal? So, um, another, another, uh, yeah, this is six large free range eggs for six hundred grams of flour. <laughs> There is a task force. We have yeah, another one. <laughs> Maybe we need another one going. Because we have more eggs here. And uh, we can have a second one. Oh, we up. can have a second. Uh, Why don't we have Maybe a second in, this, in this area. Yeah. We can have a second. Yeah. Yeah. Want to use this? The same. Now, there's a great instruction here in the official recipe. So, how, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> how do you know when a number is enough? Smooth bowl? Smooth, exactly. Your past is, um, well, this is an interesting, because this is, uh, we, we, we did some, um, yeah, we did some observations of veterinary surgeons many years ago at Cornell University, and many of them are involved in tasks exactly like this, where you have to do something for a period of time, but you can't say exactly how long that period of time is. It's not like, you can't, the structure says, do not need for five minutes. Or, and many skills in science are like that. You have to look for something to change, but you can't have a mechanistic thing. So that one of the things they have is like searching for, when they open up animals, they're looking for where the organs are. They can't find it. And they have an idea of how long it would be appropriate to have a search uh, routine. You can't search for, for, for weeks, it's too long. But one second is too short. So often these things are like envelopes. They're kind of like tips, explicit things that are explicated, but they can't be, and it depends upon the unfolding of the very materiality of, of what we're dealing with here. So we can't, it's this hard to the specify the exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. And this, by the way, is why it's very hard in the problem of artificial intelligence to get a robot or a machine to do this well. <laughs> because of the, uh, not only of this haptic skill, <laughs> yeah, and when to stop as well, that crucial moment. Because if you stop too early, it seems your pasta will taste pretty horrible. And if you go on too long, I imagine, you, you spoil your, your uh, dough. But this is a beautiful technique. Sylvia, is this this you is using? Yes, but uh, my mother is from uh, Bologna. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there is a regional. So this looks like classic technique, <laughs> which looks, yeah, are your hands clean? This is a thing, uh, I guess everyone should wash their hands before they start. <laughs> oh, it no, it's better not to. <laughs> Depends on your theory of germs and how it figures in, it's going to be cooked anyway. <laughs> is there uh, only one way to do? This kneading technique is very different. To, to Marta's, her technique is different, I think, in the way she's kneading. Yes. So I think there's lots of different local techniques. So this is an interesting thing as well. Um, there's a, a, a colleague of mine, Michael Lynch, who looked at scientists following recipes in, in labs for doing a technique called plasma prep. And he found there were all sorts of local variations. Different labs did it in different ways. So although there were some basic instructions, each lab would involve its own culture as the best way to do it. And this is, I suspect this is very true of, of needing that each you know, family or person has a different technique. But it's interesting that she uh, showed the same movement that I move with my hands yeah. when I prepare the dough for cooking the pizza. But, but nobody taught me how to do that. <laughs> the contrary, her mother taught yeah. her, and yeah. the movement was subtle things. Yeah. There is a reason for that. Yeah, well, maybe you were exposed uh, in early in your childhood to this movement. You can't no, remember. No, no, not my mother. <laughs> not your mother, but maybe somebody else, or you saw it on television? No. No? Uh, maybe, so maybe some of these skills, what are you suggesting? That this kind of a genetic way of needing? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite a complicated movement. No, it's not complicated. I think it's natural. No, well, you don't, I mean, it's hard to realize, I think, how complicated skills are, but think of examples like tying a shoelace, right? For us, it's so easy to do. But you watch your child. The, the trouble is, we cannot remember 
How did we learn? How did we learn? And the child, you can sometimes sit there just like struggling. Why well, can't you just do it? And just tying a shoelace for us is easy. So I suspect that even this sort of manipulation, you know, if we had a child here doing this the first time, we would find all the ways they could screw it up. Now we are skilled, many of these skills we are shared, like needing. We hope. <laughs> So once it's ready, we can we can use that tool to. Ah, okay. But it, ha, ha, how Somebody do you know? Wants to how do you know it's uh, what's your name? Kalian. Kalian. How do you know it's smooth enough yet? When do we stop? This is what I want to find out. Because this seems should a crucial be, be. point. How do you tell smoothness? <laughs> This, <laughs> it, it looks smooth. It looks smooth. It doesn't look like any different to Maybe me. not enough. You know there is a... Um, Are you feeling it as well? Yeah, yeah. It's the feel. Because uh -huh. it says a silky feel, so I guess from your, your hands. That's what's taking a moment. Yeah, remember your hands have an incredible number of nerves here. So these are some of the most sensitive, sensitive senses we have in our bodies. These hands for feeling. My grandmother used to do it. Yeah. Have you done this before? No. No. <laughs> ah, so you're observing the experiment the first time. <laughs> it was my mother, but. Trevor, maybe you can say something about the experimental regress for people who are not familiar with this. Okay, yeah. yeah. So this is the problem that you, you raised of, uh, of, of, uh, of not being able to repeat. So, um, as I said at the beginning, making cooking pasta is something everyone knows can be done. It's a skill that we can do, it's a, that it will work, and uh, we may not be, if we, if we fail today, it's not because cooking pasta was not possible. It was that we were not skillful enough to do it today. But there's a class of, I alluded to this earlier, there's a class of phenomena at the research frontiers where a scientist will claim they have an, a, a new experimental result and other people will disagree with them. Okay, and they'll say, no, your experiments are wrong. We, have, we do this experiment and we don't find the phenomena, the particle that you're looking for. So then the issue becomes, it's, it's not like the, the laser case or the pasta case. The question becomes, is this a new phenomenon of the world, and who has the skill? So maybe it's the scientists who are finding the phenomena are the skilled ones, or maybe it's the ones who don't find it are the skilled ones. Do so you have a problem of saying in this, this particular case, who are the skilled so, so people? The that, okay. And this problem of who are the skilled people, or the competent people, the research funders, is, is has a name, a technical name, called the experimenter's regress. Because there's no way of solving this regress by doing more experiments, because you still get the issue of who are the skilled experimenters again. And so a way of thinking about this is, um, I, I, I've suggested this in this article that I was reading earlier, as an article I published about science and cooking in a, a science magazine a while ago. And um, you, you can think of it like a, a TV chef. So you see a, a dish being cooked on it by a TV chef. And you think, oh, this is a great dish. I want to try this at home. So you write down all the ingredients. And then, as is typical with science, you may improve on some of the ingredients. You may, like the olive oil they're using on the TV station doesn't look as good as your own favorite olive oil. So you may change a few things. And then I say, imagine this. So you try and cook this dish at home. And perhaps you've you know, been cooking for a while. You have some expertise. And you cook this dish, and it doesn't work, OK? Instead of it being a beautiful, whatever it is, pasta, blah, 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 it looks horrible, tastes horrible, is horrible. So then, your failure, you have to then decide, this is experiment, is it that I have the skill and this is not a good dish? Or is it that they have the skill and I haven't yet acquired the skill to make this dish? And you could, so you could try it again, you could go to the website, get the ingredients exactly, and then repeat it exactly as much as you can by using exactly the same ingredients and then you the second time you do it supposing it fails again 
Now you are facing, the dilemma you face in repeating that recipe is exactly the same dilemma I think that the scientists at the research frontiers face when they cannot replicate an experiment. They have to make a decision. Is this a genuine new phenomenon? Who has the skill? And the skill to do it and the phenomena kind of are, are, are linked to each other. They go together. It's hard to disentangle them. Um, now you can bring in other things in science to disentangle them. You can bring in, you can say one scientist is more credible than another, or I'm going to use my theoretical knowledge to say why this new idea is impossible. And that can, we call that, can break the regress, this circularity. So I think cooking is an interesting way of thinking about some of these issues that the research projects in science. So when you try and repeat a recipe, you're doing in a sort of a small scale way some of the things that they're doing at CERN, where they're looking for the, you know, the Higgs boson, and Fermilab is looking for it as well. Um, but with most, there's an awful, there's more stability probably about the dishes that are possible in cooking. I don't know. It's interesting. To, no one's ever done. My co uh, Professor Buki has written a whole book on cooking and science, so this is his, his expertise. I think most people haven't thought what is the parallel exactly between cooking and science. We know they they, they weave in together. But I think it's interesting to think about in terms of methodology. The process of science, our work shows, is sometimes very messy, and cooking can be very messy. <laughs> uh, so this is the experiment is regress. Yes. Um, so now, how, how maybe maybe we can try to, to how do you say in English? I don't know. Yeah, flatten it. Have you have you reached the point? So yeah, this is the crucial thing. You have to decide it's smooth enough. Yeah, we, we didn't collectively <laughs> decide that the smoothness is the other And can you ex explicate what it is about the smoothness? The smoothness uh, is, a, is a feeling, uh, <laughs> it's both, uh, both feelings. And on one side is dry yeah. and on one side is uh, soft and uh, you can uh, uh, dive your finger in yeah. it and, uh, and see the, the, the pasta breathe. Yeah. Yeah, has to breathe. What's the has to breathe? Breathing. 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 Yes. Yeah, I like this pushing the finger because that's like a real <laughs> yeah. rule of thumb. That's a rule of thumb. Yeah. So it's like the bounciness with which it comes back. Is yeah. that how you tell? Yeah, it's like uh, a lung. Yeah. So it's a sort of spring in the pasta. Yeah. yeah. And, um, that is probably hard to get from a video, looking at someone at this point of a video at that mm. moment. Because uh, YouTube resolution probably doesn't look very, it looks pretty much the same. Yeah. So you need to have the haptic of touching it. Touch. Yes. So if yes. you were training somebody up, you'd invite them to put their thumb right in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're training your son to cook pasta. <laughs> and that for a little. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Now this this instruction, there's no secret to needing, right? There's a lot of reference to have all these grandmothers having arms like Frank Bruno. <laughs> You'll know when to stop, all right? We stop. So then all you need to do is wrap your pasta in cling film and put it in the fridge to rest for at least half an hour before you use it. Yeah, we're gonna skip this. Uh, this is the uh, idea that it's. Mm. Better to manipulate when it's colder. Mm. No. 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 This is not our no, this, no, this, no, this, this is this for is an, this again a different pasta. This is a different yeah. sort of pasta. For, for cakes, I do that for cakes. Yeah. Yeah. Pasta, uh, pasta frolla. Pasta frolla. Yeah. Yeah. The the okay. Yeah. Yeah. The battery one. Okay, so the next decision is have you got a pasta machine? <laughs> <laughs> no. We don't. No. We don't have a no, pasta no, machine. No. Okay, it's not the end of the world. Uh, all the mamas I met while traveling around Italy rolled pasta with their trusty rolling pins. And they wouldn't even consider having a pasta machine in the house. When it comes to rolling, the main problem you'll have is getting the pasta thin enough to work with. It's quite difficult to get a big lump of dough rolled out into one piece, and you need a very long rolling pin to do the job properly. <laughs> The way around this is to roll lots of small pieces of pasta rather than a few big ones. Ah, this is what it's suggesting. You'll be rolling your pasta into a more circular shape than the long rectangular shapes you'll get from a machine, but use your head and you'll be all right. Okay. <laughs> use your head and you'll be all right. Yeah. So you have to make a decision. We have to put some flour, farina, on the, before we... Oh no. 
Yeah, it doesn't say this. Another thing that's not in the instructions. <laughs> yeah, and the way she's spreading the flour, of course. The tapping. It's a noise practice. <laughs> I've never seen such a long rolling pin. Yeah. Ah, put the flour on the rolling pin. Okay. You have to hold the rolling pin, uh, the board down as well. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Dai, intanto te lo tengo. Aderisce, aderirà. Su, se no scivola. Però bisogna fare una cosa. Ma intanto lo tengo. Sì, dai, guarda. Ci sono, non lo tenere. Sai, ci vorrebbe una cosa di un bilietto da sotto, bagnato. Ma adesso sta andando a bagnare. So what do you do when you have this problem sticking to the thing? A bit more flour, maybe? Yes, I think so. Now, um, while we're doing this, here's an interesting thought again about science versus this sort of activity. My daughter is um, doing molecular biochemistry at the University of Pennsylvania in America. And it's like it, she's an organic chemist. And I went in her lab recently and she's synthesizing a molecule. And what's so interesting is that there's very few digital pieces of equipment in her laboratory. So it's, it, uh, it's an interesting issue because a lot of science is more digital. You know, there's digital equipment. But um, cooking, Apart from, you may have a digital scale, apart from this sort of high-tech cooking that, you, that uh, uh, Professor Bookie studies, uh, most of cooking like this is pretty analog. Um, it's more like chemistry, actually. I think the, the science that's most like is organic chemistry. Because uh, my observations of her organic chemistry lab is that there are lots of solutions there. She's synthesizing this molecule. It's a 15-stage synthesis. And you basically, she says, you just mess around. You, add, you don't know quite what's going to be. This is the first time this molecule's been synthesized. You, don't, you have to have different things, catalysts you add to it. There's jars of solution, sulfuric acid, and then mixing in a fume. It's the closest thing I've seen to cooking. But then you go and uh, somebody here was saying they were looking at metadata. It's a scientist. Was it, who, who was looking at the metadata? It's you, sorry. Yeah. Um, and that's much more digital, digi digitized data. So I think there's interesting issues to think about these sorts of skills and how they translate into a digital realm as well. Now, uh, uh, do you have to use these tacit skills when you're dealing with much more digitized entities? Um, it's something to think about. I, I think you still, but they're different sorts of skills. So that's not a question for you to think about. <laughs> Because cooking is obviously more like chemistry because you're stirring, you're pushing, and you're smelling. The smell and, and sometimes you're tasting in chemistry, I'm told. There is uh, um, a good job to do that sometimes may happen to, 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 to talk when you use meteorological data, when you deal with very old data who are uh, written down in books. Yeah. So sometimes we have to decide <laughs> um, that 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 we do, uh, and right. it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, good, good, um, it's a kind of experience. Experience. You get a nose for it. Yeah. You you must know what uh, can be the reasons for that temperature to be lower or higher or. There are a lot of tricks, for example, you can always suspect that minimum has been uh, the change to the maximum, or that someone missed to, to put the sign uh, minus right. the number, so that's a number of, of uh, 
Mm. Analogic processes. Yeah. 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 Right. That's a very interesting one because that's where I had the data entry. Which is a much more analog. Okay, what is the cambio? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? next? Ilaria, I'm not strong enough. Well, come on, you can't have a chance to get there. Maybe you can, maybe we can cut. Is that what you suggest? Yeah, so two people can do it at the same time. You have, there's a knife behind you. Boxer. Here we are. Just your work, sir. It's not going to be fast, it's not going to be open. Oh. <ride> no, come dire, io non, non, credo che sia una di quelle situazioni in cui appunto si mettono le competenze in collettivo, no? So now, how do you decide when it's thin, thin enough? Yeah, that's, that's the key point. Yeah. Well, we'll be tired. Yeah, it's just a, here's something else to, to worry about. Sorry? Is there a measure of the... No, but it, it says... No. Yeah, pasta dries out much quicker than you think. So whatever recipe you're doing, don't leave it more than a minute or two before cutting and shaping. So this is a temporal thing. You should only do this very quickly. Wait, what? Quick? Which shape should I... No, or you can lay over a damp, clean tea cloth. Doesn't matter. So you can have a damp... Clop over to stop it drying out. Yeah, cool. Another tip. I can give you a rule of thumb for determining the correct um, thickness of the dough. Mm -hmm. It is for not for the fast, but for student. The dough has to be so thin that you can read a lot of the uh, uh, <laughs> but I don't know if we will be able to do this with this kind of stuff. No, there's, there is a there is something like that here. I remember reading this. Uh, there's some that was about the quite. Now to cut it, the, the suggestion of the local chef is to make maltagliati, so mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, so shape so I don't know the English doesn't matter. Ro rombi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But since we have a chef here, we, we can ask him mm. what is the best. So, is, do you think this is too thick? Mm. This is too thick. Too thick, yeah. Yes. Too thick? Yeah. You can so walk here and you can see it. Katia, can we can we have Anna and your way? Can you read and 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 So it says here, the, somewhere between the thickness of a beer mat and a playing card. Somewhere between. If you're making stuff past like ravioli or tortellini, you need to make it thinner. Where you can clearly see your hand or lines of newsprint through it. So if you have to see your hand through it, uh, uh, that's only for tor tortellini and ravioli. So at some point we need somebody on the cut. I suspect this is expert chef. This guy. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can get him to cut. Somebody has a theory that it's also dependent on the weather. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is humidity. Yeah. You get more time for this drying out of this dark. Who's in charge? <laughs> you think we're ready to cut? So you can get a knife or the for Attila if he wants to cut. <laughs> I already did a mistake. <laughs> what kind of um, maltagliati? He suggested maltagliati where we can do whatever we want. But 
what size? Uh, um, this? Is there? Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what is my <laughs> So um, I think there is an additional layer here, Trevor, which yeah. is which is the fact that Italians never agree on anything. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to a bar, there's four different types of coffee yeah. and four yeah. different people. Yeah. So So um when I, we worked studying veterinary surgeons as we're using the knife here, the hardest skill for a veterinary surgeon to learn is the right amount of pressure to the initial incision into the skin of the animal. Because if you go too much, you obviously mm -hmm. damage organs underneath, but if you don't go enough, then you've got a problem, because you yeah. have lots of cuts. Yeah. And so, so that's something they really have to measure. learn. You don't think that you can measure. Yeah. Each animal is slightly yeah. different. So they, have, they get a feel, so they get a haptic have feel to back as touch. they're doing it. Yeah. They can look at the animal as they're doing it, they can adjust. Um, and, but it has to be a comp yeah, but you could imagine that a child could cut this much to hacking. I mean, we are, these are pretty skilled. So we're all pretty, you know, pretty the skilled at knife manipulation the already. But for a surgeon, it's very much, much harder. What are you doing, Cassie? So then you get into this debate with these skills. How can machines replace them? And can a machine do it the same as a human? So in surgery, the argument is. The yeah. Uh, can you can you work well, on a model? Better, better than a person. Right. Or not? Can a machine do it better? And can you do uh, models that emulate the cutting of skin? So can surgeons learn on haptic systems that are, that you know, are not? Bodies basically, so there will be something that simulates a body and they can learn on. And this so there's all these issues can it, can it, can it reproduce? And what's the merits of learning that way? Um, and there's a big arguments about surgeons about whether this is good or not to, to learn this way on machines and to replace the, the cutting of the skin. I'm pretty certain that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> Don't cut yourself because mm. how it is not get it out. So what's this, these lumps he's putting in? Tortellini. 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 That's how you make tortellini. Ah, okay. Lo stampo. Is this tagliatelle? Okay, I'm going to give you a plate. So what did you put inside there? It's like a, a fake uh, filling. Uh, ah. It should be meat, but it's, uh, it's pasta ah. actually. It's yeah. like tortellini. Yeah, and I should put the, the, the inside and the... I think another yeah, This is really skillful, yeah. this is like... How yeah, do, I would get these all muddled up together. Yeah. <laughs> I think another analogy between yeah. cooking and science is that uh, some cooks always need an assistant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the TV. Like some scientists. Yeah. When you see these TV shows of complicated uh, chefs at work, it's, it does seem like a team effort. Um, different people are delegated, and that's like a, more like a surgical operation where you have a team effort as well, coordinated work. I think it what are we going to do here? Mm. Um, it's supposed to be tortellini. tortellini. Yeah. Fake tortellini without uh, meat okay. inside. But Could they pretend it to be tortellini. Uh, yeah. uh, Just pretending. Yeah. Can I? In tondo. Così. Mm -hmm. Prima provo, provo in tondo per vedere. Ah, si, li cuociamo anche? Sì, così si assaggiamo. Ah, è vero, è vero, un bicchiere. Qualcuno ha detto all'inizio che non si, non si mangia. Sì, no, no, è spesso è non ho visto, visto l'orario, però. Ah! Visto per vedere, yeah. vedere il risultato. Ce la sarò per il bicchiere. Eh, yeah, un po'. So this is a nice tip where you use a, a wine glass. Repurpose a wine glass to... Yeah. Creative uses of technology. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a Galileo. Yeah. Yeah. And voila. Voila. What is this? It's a tortellino. It's a tortellino. It's a big oh, tortellino. Okay. Okay. No, it's interesting. This practice Too big we have tortellino. in our, our kitchen, my mother does this more scones as well. This is a really standard no. cooking yeah. practice, isn't it? <laughs> Using a wine glass to make it. Okay. 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 Mm. <laughs>
campo libero. Ma ah, tagliatelli al finish? Ah, sì, sì, no, no, no. Ok. Il tortellino, sì. So, why in Italy is it such a big deal? It's basically the same dough. You just rearrange it a bit. Why is it such a big deal? I must have tortellini versus something else. It doesn't taste any different, does it? The type of dough, you mean? Yeah, the dough is all the same. Yeah. No, so why? No, it's different. No, it's different. No. No. It's, it's different, different isn't it? Because the, the, the type of pasta is. Uh, <laughs> wow. Wow. wow! I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Do, it Do it again. Do it again. We're gonna have a video of that. Um, this this is square, square. okay. And um, this is a piece of uh, meat or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And you have to put the meat uh, there and then uh, to close uh, the pasta. Yeah. And then to, to do this movement and then mm. to. Oh. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's just like the real thing. Mm. Mm. This is. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we can also finish this with matagliati or whatever, so we can send the whole thing down to the food. Yes. The, uh, this pasta is fresh pasta, and you can, make, you, can, you can make it on your own. But the pasta of spaghetti, etc., is uh, made of uh, grano duro. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, wait. So it's not made of eggs. And, uh, and, it's right. and it's been dried, I think, for yeah. quite yeah. a long yeah, yeah. time. It's a totally different... So if somebody would be, what, what would happen if they tried to make spaghetti here for the first time? Would they be seen as crazy? <laughs> Uh, or creative. No, I think you can make it. Could be a new edition. You can make a tagliolini thinner than this. The point is that. Why could you just roll this, like roll it like spaghetti? There is uh, macaroni no, no, done no, no. Uh, with a uh, meat in uh, iron yeah. and just running the dough around. Ah. But the materials are much thicker. Than I think that for spaghetti there is some machine that is needed, like uh, so it's like thick, thick like spaghetti, yeah. Mm. 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 Bucatino. Yeah. Bucatini. Bucatini are the empty ones. Bucatini are the empty spaghetti. Ah, yeah. 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 It's like a holy ritual, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe we can so the yeah. I mean, can you sort of predict, looking at it, say it's probably not very good? Ah, maybe, maybe they have, maybe they have to call it from. Okay. Let's go. Eh? Yeah, but they have to tell. <laughs> yeah, we don't know yet if this is a if this pasta is good until we eat it. It is cooked. I really think that for food, that's crucial. That uh, there's something it can look nice before it's cooked, and then the cooking is the key thing. It's going to be a cooked food, right? Obviously, if it's not cooked, it doesn't matter. So that's just an obvious point. And about what we've done here today, we are, um, I'm just amazed at the skills that you... Uh, this is a cultural thing. Because I come from a British kitchen, and all these skills for these different sorts of pasta, I didn't want to possess any of these skills myself. And we could have had me doing this, and you would have just laughed. It would have been so bad. So that's something also that's interesting how culturally specific, I mean, Italian culture, maybe different even regionally, how s much skill you guys all have. Uh, 
doing this activity, the different ways of cutting, folding, blah, 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 all these ways that you did very remarkably quickly. And this, I still think it's, uh, you bring in a child, then you realize how tough it is, or someone from a different culture. Um, and then this is an unusual situation, but, um, because this is a, a learning situation, so there's new things happening, collaboration. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting how people have collaborated together here for the first time, like a collaborative science experiment. People sharing their bits of knowledge, which is different. Um, but to do this even better, we'd have to cook a dish that, that was... This is one, not like the Experimentus Rigos, this is a dish that pasta we know exists. And you, we, if we fail, it's because we lack the skill. But what would be interesting would be to try to devise this exercise with a, an example of a new dish, but we didn't even know it was going to work or not. Mm. And then we could have a, a, an argument about whether it was going to work, and we could have two groups trying to do it. Maybe, they would, maybe they would, by chance they would come out with different outcomes as possible, or they used slightly different methods. So that, that would be more like the scientific lab where you have two competing labs and you have arguments. <laughs> um, so this is... It's 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 sort of like a model of science. So do you think you do? I mean, so that's. I mean, maybe I should stop there. But it's it's trying to get at um, the importance of this. So if you if you go from this to science, you just have to use your imagination. But I don't think it's so different that many of the activities we've done today, practical lab activities, would be involved in science as well. And so you can see why you have to, like just with cooking, you have to learn these. You've learned these practices. It's from your parents, probably brothers and sisters. And this cultural aspect of science, would, which is clear for cooking, I'm going to extend this to, to science by analogy here. Um, yeah, I wanted to read. Uh, yeah. Now, this, we have an expert on no, no, I'm not the expert. I just finished yeah. this book on, uh, it's called The Newton Chicken in Poland in Newton, Science in the Kitchen. Uh, here's a mm. few poster. Mm. Uh, so, if I read this out, Add the appropriate quantity of culture. <laughs> Inspect cultures every day to determine the optimal density for inactivation. When the cell starts getting the aspect of cobblestones, they should be passaged. Make the plates gently oscillate. Resuspend the cells, pipetting several times up and down. Dilute the, suspension, the, sub, the cell suspension in a small quantity of culture. Uh, this is, looks like a recipe, but it's actually from a contemporary stem cell methods manual by Robert Lanza and Klimanska. And, uh, and to me, I mean, this is just a striking example of what uh, Professor Pinch was describing. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the analogies between science and cooking is exactly this. I mean, the, the importance of tacit knowledge, the importance of training the eye, uh, there, are, there are several uh, books and research, like uh, Goodwin uh, book, the sense, I think it's The Sense of Seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you train the eye in, in certain fields, like chemistry or archaeology or in cooking. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> and of course, then I try also to, to, to explore other, other uses of science in cooking, mm -hmm. like molecular astronomy. It's a, it's a very... Mm -hmm. Uh, easy one to think about, which has an interesting story uh, because it was invented in Italy. Uh, I didn't know before starting working on this book. There was a symposium in Erice at the end of the 80s where a physicist uh, met uh, the wife of another physicist who uh, was a professional cook, or she had a passion of him for cooking, and uh, they decided they were going to propose to make a workshop about science and cooking. And okay. <laughs> who's gonna taste? Uh, maybe Professor Pinch with oh, yeah. first, yeah. and then another. Yeah. Another. But I mean, you have to be an expert on tasting <laughs> yes. as well. And maybe the other one. Uh, e l'altra per loro okay. no, l'altra non ci aveva due pentole quindi avete questo ah ok, ok, okay. okay. So ci sono le, le forchette <laughs> I tell you this, if I was served this in a restaurant, I would be saying this is not a very good restaurant. 
<laughs> what do you think? But this may be just because I'm not expert. <laughs> it's very, it's, it's not, computer. I like it softer, but that may be just my British prejudice. Okay. Well, now, you, we need an Italian good. expert now. Sure. Should have been cooked for. I don't know. But then the question is, was it the very making or was it the cooking? Mm. <laughs> Am I too harsh? <laughs> no, it's not good. You're right. Um, ah. I mean, I'm really hungry, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but <laughs> yes, it doesn't taste. Um, mm. It's not enough salt. <laughs> it depends on the on okay. the bottom. Okay. <laughs> 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 and and bottom. I don't know. Ma dipende dalla bollitura o dal... Eh, non lo so, quello è troppo difficile come lo Però vuoi... Maybe it was cooked Yes, for a reason. Yeah. You can blame. It's thing. Blame some other group. We did it well, but the other group... It's impossible to get. Sorry? Yeah. It's quite impossible to get when you try to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, don't let me know what I'm saying. It's not cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You're not obliged. <laughs> oh, in Italy, um, uh, the physicist Di Kiki, hmm, who was at the yeah. time head, he said, okay, let's have this seminar, but Science and cooking is not a respectable title for a scientific institution, so let's call it molecular gastronomy, <laughs> which, which didn't make any sense to the organizer, and it was just an analogy, again, with molecular biology, which was the hot field of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting from uh, uh, Harold McGee, who was one of the protagonists of this, uh, this time. And actually, thinking about your idea of making a new thing, uh, one of the physicists who started this, this workshop, which has been going on for, for many years, uh, was to make something called Caldone. Hmm? Caldone. I, I read you. So the, the dream of this physicist was to make the equivalent of ice cream for the winter. So he described the properties. It should be hot. It should last for long. So can be leaked, for example. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to eat it while walking, like an ice cream. It should be in a container. If possible, this container should be possible to eat it with low thermal conductivity and good resistance to the heat. It should have a high thermal capacity and it should be acquoso, waterproof. It shouldn't leave with the feelings of thirsty after having eaten. It should be easy to prepare and be cheap. It should be available for a long time in cold uh, months, in the cold season, and should have a, a, a good taste, slightly uh, sweet. Hmm? So Nicolas Curti, physicist in Oxford, uh, claimed he had made already the caldone, which was the opposite of baked Alaska, which I think is a, it's a, it's a sweet. Right? Yes, so this, it is, uh, uh, it's got ice cream in the middle, meringue around yeah. it. Yeah. But this doesn't comply to the request number three. You cannot eat it while working. True. And then he said, uh, a hot thing you can eat walking are caldarroste, chestnuts, roasted chestnuts. Mm. But requisite five is not satisfied, and they're not always available. <laughs> so that was one of the challenges uh, of molecular uh, gastronomy. Another way in which uh, there are two very interesting ways in which science and cooking come in contact. One is when, you know, in the beginning of modern science, science is a new activity. Mm? And so uh, the, these new scientists, which are not called scientists because scientist is a recent word, it was introduced in 1833 for the first time, uh, had to describe and to show the relevance of their work, for example, to noblemen, to prince, to people uh, uh, supporting their activity. So a number of times, either they apply their science to cooking, mm, for example, I found a very nice quotation by Francesco Redi, one of the founders of modern biology, who is asked by a colleague the receipt of a chocolate 
cream, the chocolate you drink with jasmine, a special chocolate with jasmine. And the answer I cannot say because it's a it's a patented receipt. That's the sense of his answer. Uh, no, it doesn't say patent. Uh, he said you shouldn't ask me because this is a secret I have to keep. Uh, My grandma as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, it's very famous. You know, uh, Francis Bacon was was using this metaphor of hunting uh, for for science, like. Really, the scientist was smelling the traces uh, uh, of, uh, of what he was uh, uh, trying to, to, to understand and discover. And another way, uh, later on, is actually use cooking to criticize other scientists' work. Hmm? When you want to degrade, how do you say, degrade or degradate? Uh, debunk. Uh, debunk. Uh, for example, in the cold fusion case, uh, which I've studied uh, a few years ago. Uh, there was a controversy, you know, these two guys, one chemist and one physicist, claimed they had achieved cold fusion, so fusion at low temperature, with a very simple apparatus. And one of the ways the critics were, were uh, uh, used to, to uh, attack them was, uh, this is an old soup, hmm? this is a reheat an old soup, uh, it is uh, uh, because they, they themselves had said we have started in the kitchen to emphasize that it was a very simple experiment uh, mm -hmm. compared to high energy physics or to uh, hot fusion. But, but already you know, in the, in the eight, 18th century, for example, there's a famous controversy between Lyle and Delabeche, and at some point uh, Delabeche uh, makes a cartoon. Uh, to make fun of Lyell, and uh, maybe I can circulate this, and, and you see Lyell is, is portrayed with the soup, uh, and the smell of his soup is fooling, uh, is fooling these people. So these people are fooled, uh, the, that's the critique mm -hmm. of the Labesh, uh, by something which smells mm, nicely, but is not, is not a, a relevant theory. Uh, this is, this is just one uh, of the uh, of the example, uh, the, the, there are also, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, Babbage, the mathematician, uh, he wrote a very strong pamphlet, which I think was aimed mainly at the Royal Society, uh, criticizing the state of science in Britain. And when he describes scientific fraud, uh, so bad behaviors of scientists. He says one of the ways to trick scientific data is cooking. And cooking, he means. your data, yeah. And by cooking, he means either altering the data or choosing only the data that are compatible with your theory. Yeah. Uh, I really have to do it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Cooking your data. He also had trimming, didn't he? I wonder where that comes yeah. from. Trimming is like trimming a sail in, in sailing. Yeah. So somehow the association maybe of these more mundane activities is what, is what, yeah. <laughs> it's like my first example when I said Gina peers at bleary eyed at the gel versus the gel is observed. That by putting in the mundane world that there's a real person there, Gina, and she's looking at something, bleary-eyed, that takes away some of the aura of science from it. And so when you want to debunk something, you reintroduce the human, the human in their mundane activity. Hey, science isn't so special after all, it's just people messing around. Yeah. So I suspect that's the, also that use of cooking and, and trimming from sailing, these mundane activities, not to, to debunk here. Yeah. Um, so that's... Uh, I had to say on this. Uh, Any, anyone, mm. anyone who has comments, questions? Attila, or sorry. Yes, I have Tilania. a question. Science is interesting in kitchen and cooking and science. Mm -hmm. And the point is that, like, uh, we, uh, what we call popular culture in uh, cooking is uh, seen as a good thing, and in science it is seen like uh, a negative thing or not a real science matter. I mean, so this can be a difference. I mean, 
what I can learn uh, from my grandma is yeah. popular culture and uh, is something good, yeah. something uh, through... But it is not science. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So are you saying that the, the difference between cooking and science is that science is a specialist esoteric activity, so it, it's less amenable to popular culture? Because it's um, done in these hidden off places, laboratories. And what I meant is that um, if I uh, I learned something about cooking, yeah. uh, because uh, someone told me about uh, about that is a yeah. positive uh, thing. But yeah. if I I learn something about science or scientific mm. issues, uh, mm. which is uh, like uh, a popular voice, yeah. usually is not uh, as good as. Uh, but why isn't it seen as being a, a good thing to know some, some science? I'm still not getting No, because usually it's not real science. Oh, so it's not that... scientific. If it's yeah. popular or if it's... Um, By definition, it would be. <laughs> 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 hmm. If it's... Um, in a book, um, rumor. Yes. If it's a like, popular rumor or popular culture, usually it's not uh, yeah. scientific. Like. Uh, so this is the whole problem of... Uh, can lay people have scientific expertise? And is, yeah. Can you have a popular culture of science? Yes. And this is a very interesting issue. Because I think, uh, I would argue you can. And you can have expert, we have in, in our field of science, we look at cases where people can have expertise, but it's not credentialed expertise. So you may not have a PhD in it, but you st still share a lot of knowledge. And uh, there have been some case studies of, of, say, AIDS activists who contribute to clinical control trials of AIDS, drugs, who had no, initially no technical expertise but were able to make a contribution to the science. So there's several cases, I think, of this lay expertise, where they, they, it, uh, it's not credential, but it's a real expertise. But yeah, I'm thinking of the case, famous mm. case, you know, of Harrison, the watchmaker who solved the problem of longitude. Yeah. That's probably another... Yeah, he had some sort of scientific expertise, but it wasn't granted by the Royal Society yeah, at the time. Um, the other thing, that I, I mean, there's another is interesting issue that came up, I thought, from our discussion of when I proposed um, making a new form of spaghetti, I, I sensed <laughs> pushback. People were, and I think that science and, and cooking, both of these cultural things we've built, and if you've got a culture that you've built and you live with, naturally you're invested in it and it's almost by definition conservative. Because if you have a way of doing something that's familiar, you kind of resist the new. And I think this is true of science, that this is a huge debate in science. Why moments of scientific revolution are so few and far between? Most scientists work within what's accepted already rather than... And if you come up with something new, the chance is very hard to get it accepted. It's quite a conservative culture. I think cooking is like this as well. I'm just observing today. <laughs> I don't know what you think about that. That's an interesting one. I don't know if you address this in your book, so you have to think about this. The, the, um, so it's, it's quite hard probably to innovate in the Italian kitchen. I don't know. <laughs> Especially if you're British. You have no, so this is, you see, this is like in science as well, the rhetoric, where you come from. Uh, I, I interviewed scientists at Caltech, and they're, they're open, uh, this is a, a Kellogg Radiation Lab at California Institute of Technology, and they do a certain sort of measurement there. And they told these scientists told me explicitly, you know, when we get these results from Russia, we don't trust them. We don't trust the Italian measurements. <laughs> the Germans are usually okay, but we really we only believe it if we do it at Caltech. And um, so this sort of hierarchy based in terms of I mean, here national stereotypes comes into the science as well, just like it does into cooking. You know, Brits can't cook. Or can't say they can't cook pasta. This is kind of jokey thing, but it is also part of the lived culture. Things we know about that goes around. So just for the scientists, they live this culture and they can't take everything claimed seriously. It's a busy world. They can't look at every paper. So they have to have their quick way of sorting this out. Don't trust this group versus I trust this group. Mm. So trust is another really important thing in science, who you trust. <laughs> mm. uh, or not. If there is only one way to do it correctly, a machine can do it. Or not. I don't think so. We have a machine that can do it. Uh, with um, a high level of precision. 
this kind of, of things. And in this case, the tacit knowledge, the practical knowledge, it is not necessary. I think there are two questions. If I've understood and then, underneath it. Two, and then I have yes. another Sorry. A second question. Yeah. But I think there's two questions there that are underneath it. That, um, what tasks can machines do and whether there's only one correct way of doing a task? I think they're separate questions because um, I, I really believe that um, these studies have shown in when you follow a recipe for in molecular biology, each lab it seems has its different recipe. So they do things in different ways. It does seem to be they can get the they can get it to work. But they do it in slightly, you know, they may vary things, uh, the ordering may vary, they may substitute one reagent for another. So these studies have shown this. So it does seem there are different ways of doing things, and you can get the same outcome. So we saw this today, I think, as well. You don't have to cut the pasta that, we can cut it in a slightly different way, and you'll still get an outcome. Maybe bad pasta, but it's, it's, the outcome is the same. Um, versus what tasks can machines take over? Which... Um, I think is a, is, a, is a very, you know, this is the fundamental problem of artificial intelligence. And um, this links to, to Sir Collins, this guy who wrote about tacit knowledge, says there's certain sorts of, act, certain forms of tacit knowledge that in principle a machine cannot take over. Because these are forms of tacit knowledge that are socially learned in groups. And they form part of our form of life. And his, his example would be much more natural language. So natural language, is, machine translation, is the hardest thing to do. Natural language is different from, from this kind of, of things, not your things. Um, it's not the same. <laughs> well, it's certainly different, but I mean, um, so, but physical activities, um, I don't think it's necessarily, so you can get into this argument, could a machine, you can imagine a machine that could say play a violin, you could build a, a, a violin, but would it be able to play like a human could play, and could we tell? I think this is a, a, an interesting... I don't claim to solve this problem, but... You said the, the second question was uh, exactly of experiment, experiment, yeah. little experiment, could be a model for a, a laboratory, a scientific laboratory, uh, yeah. because I think there, there are um, some standards you have to respect in, in a laboratory. And yes. here uh, is something uh, more familiar, let's say. Uh, in this case, uh, the question is, is tacit knowledge a necessary condition for science or not? And the third one, there is a philosopher who who um, wrote a very important book, but, uh, uh, but I, I forgot his name about uh, this subject. I don't, I don't remember. Dreyfus? No. no. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but there is a, someone who says the tacit knowledge can, cannot be translated into um, um, standard knowledge. Yeah. Instructions. Yes. Instructions, yes. I think uh, Attila has something to say about that. Uh, yeah, no, it was, <coughs> no, it was Polanyi. No. Polanyi, Polanyi. Polanyi, Polanyi. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, no, I... There is another person at stake, in my opinion, uh, regarding standards of cooking and mm -hmm. science, which is... Um, how far... Uh, up, how much can we do things differently uh, without changing them? Meaning, for example, suppose that we're cooking uh, a chocolate cake, mm. but uh, we put inside vanilla. So, did we cook another thing or we cook badly a chocolate cake? A chocolate cake. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is, in a way, the point we have with the pasta today. Because we are discussing about uh, how far this pasta is from the model. So, with, with uh, theoretically, how it should be. Because, and because we could even say that this is not pasta. That this is not a bad pasta, but that we didn't cook pasta, we, we did something different. So, I mean, right question. Yeah, which is a, a typical methodological question, which is if you want, uh, 
how much you have to respect a ritual in order to reproduce the same ritual, and what are the, the parts of the ritual you can exchange without exchanging the result. Yeah. And I guess you'd argue that that boundary around what counts is like, what's the boundary around an object yeah. is very contingent. So in some circumstances, it would be seen, could be seen as a new object and others not. Um, so I don't, that, you know, it's an epigraphically great question to ask because in science studies we would look at how that boundary is negotiated. So in some circumstances, one could imagine this vanilla, you know, in the chocolate cake being seen as a legitimate form of chocolate cake. But in other circumstances, it would be a monster. Yes. Um, and this is a, there's an interesting thing in the history of mathematics by this great uh, philosopher of mathematics, uh, Imre Lakatos, a student yeah. of Karl Popper, about exactly this issue. What counts? Yeah. Yeah. How far can you stretch the? Yeah. So this is a gr uh, a great topic. What what is the boundary around something, and how do we tell? What's a natural kind? I suppose philosophers would talk about it. Yeah. Another thing that I think that are very different from science and fiction is in science we have we are no interested in at all in repeating the same thing. Uh, on the other side, when you cook, you probably want to do exactly what you have learned to do and you know that uh, goes correctly. But of course when you do an experiment you have to do it once, maybe twice to check it, but when you have done it and explained it and published it, you have no interest in doing it again. Yeah. Uh, this is for kitchen, I think uh, maybe if you are uh, a chef, uh, you like also to, to change things. Also, yeah. also, if you like cooking, you like to introduce some more changes. But um, nowadays, uh, there are uh, many people who, especially those who don't like to cook very much, who use the kitchen robots and they have to exactly follow that recipe and it's the same dine down here in Trento, like in Rome, like uh, in New York, probably the recipe is exactly the same and people eat the same kind of food uh, cooked in very different places. And this is a completely different paradigm from the, the scientific exper experiment. I agree, this is a, a very important observation. I think work on, who, who look, looks at replication, uh, historians and philosophers and sociologists who look at replication in science, you're absolutely right. Most experiments are not actually repeated because there's no need to, they fit in already. But, and if you do, you see you might do a ritual once or twice it's checked, but you, you don't spend a lot of effort. But then, of course, this is where the experiment is regress type controversies are very interesting. Because that's where you do want to do replication. If, if a new phenomenon like cold fusion, like Professor Bookie, comes up and this looks like a really important phenomenon, it goes against what we know theoretically and it will solve our energy problem, uh, fusion in a test tube, then the issue of replication becomes crucial. And then what you find is exactly your point that this, the, there's very little credit, you get the, the whole the credit economy of science, there's very little credit in repeating exactly the same experiment. So the scientists, they call it a me too. So if you publish it exactly the same, it's not got very much credit. So what they try and do is improve, improve on the experiment. So this is just like changing the olive oil. They'll add different things or they'll do it at a different temperature. They'll use a more sophisticated detector, a neutrino detector or a neutron detector or something. And then of course, because they've tried to improve it, it's not exactly the same experiment as the, the original one, there's always grounds for them pointing out the differences. So the, the people in cold fusion can say, well they didn't find the phenomena, but their experiment wasn't exactly the same as ours. So you get into this whole argument about what counts the contour, same discussion we had earlier about the contours around something for similarity and difference, which is a point made by the philosopher Wittgenstein. It's a really profound human thing. What, what, what things do we say are similar? And what do we say are different? We're doing this all the time. We're saying you know, things are similar or they're different. It's really context-bound. So this is, I think, a very important difference as well. The, this, the economy of science is somehow different as well. Novelty in cooking is not as valued. And the re I mean, you basically, you, as you say, there's an interest in just repeating the same thing because you want to eat the stuff. <laughs> so I mean, what the political economy is different because ultimately you're consuming. Stuff well in science, you're trying to produce knowledge. And that's a, some profound political economy difference between cooking and science. 
think we have time for one last question. Mm. Or comment.